Hello and welcome to Show and Tell with me, Stephen Leslie, the series where I show you some photos and then maybe if you sign up for my monthly subscription plan, I'll go on to tell you a little bit about them later on. Uh, today is episode 14 and today we're going to take a look at how photography has treated an entire section of society, which is not something you get to do very often and so I hope I don't cock it up. Uh, so come with me as we take a look at uh, the often overlooked subject of dwarves in photography. So the way that I decide the topics for these uh, films is by obviously by looking at a hell of a lot of photos and then after a while certain themes or subjects just sort of rise to the top or uh, become apparent and that's exactly what's happened here. Um, over the past few months as I've been looking at photographs for the other films I've noticed that photographers just love to photograph uh, people of diminutive stature uh, short people, little people, dwarves. And so that's what I'm going to take a look at today. I'm going to have a look at dwarves and their representation in photography and some of the photographers that have led the way. Now, uh, unfortunately, this is not a subject that starts in a particularly good place because for as long as there has been photography, people have loved to photograph dwarves and gawp at them. And so the history of this uh, subject is inevitably tied up with um, circuses and even freak shows. So some of the earliest photos of dwarves are those that advertise them or promote them as attractions. This is a fairly typical example of a family of midgets, which back then was the preferred term, called Le Maréchal Midgets, as part of a show known as the Johnny J. Jones Exposition. And in the photo you can see the full-sized impresario with his performers gathered round him all of whom have fake titles and are presented as some kind of dwarf royalty. There's a princess, a duchess and a baron. These photographs were sold as postcards and souvenirs of the shows and there are loads of them still out there. However, the most successful, famous and therefore the most photographed dwarf ever was General Tom Thumb, or to give him his real name, Charles Stratton, who was born in 1838 so not long after the invention of photography, and was discovered by the American showman P.T. Barnum when he was just four years old, and spent the rest of his life travelling the world and being put on display purely because he was short. Tom Thumb was one of the first truly global superstars. Uh, Barnum took him around the world and he hung out with Abraham Lincoln and Queen Victoria, although unfortunately I can't find any photographs of that, and he was forever being dressed up in a succession of bizarre costumes. Here he is fighting a flamingo in a nappy in stereoscope. Um, here he is dressed as Napoleon. He was often photographed in kilts or standing in the hands of full-size soldiers. In 1863, Barnum arranged the wedding of the century when General Tom Thumb married Lavinia Warren, known as the Little Queen of Beauty. The New York Times described them as the loving Lilliputians and people queued for hours to get a glimpse of the happy couple. Incidentally, they never had any children of their own, but that didn't stop Barnum from getting them to pose with a baby that he tried to pass off as theirs until rumours started to circulate that it was a con and then he claimed that the baby had died tragically. Now, none of these photographs are particularly remarkable, but what they are is valuable historical documents of a time when society and people's attitude was quite different to what it is now. Although, as we'll go on to see, maybe our attitudes haven't changed quite that much. The first photographer to take a proper, non-sensationalist look at dwarves was August Sander. An incredibly brief introduction to Sander would be to describe him as a German portrait and documentary photographer whose landmark work was People of the 20th Century, in which he endeavoured to record the whole of humanity by photographing as many types of people as he could across the entirety of German society. He shot the images for the project over 50 years and he never really finished it. At the time of his death, it ran to seven volumes and 49 different portfolios. And because Sander's vision was so broad and he didn't wish to exclude anyone from his project, he necessarily included dwarves. So I think the very first ones he photographed were these two brothers, and you can see that the photograph attempts to give them some dignity. They're not placed next to a dog or a full-size person for perspective. 
They are treated on their own terms. The background's been thrown out of focus and they're both smartly dressed in suits. The same goes for this photograph of a midget woman from 1920. And here, it's difficult to tell that this woman is indeed a dwarf, as again, Sander doesn't allow any other visual clues to invade the frame. The problem with people of the 20th century, though, is more one of taxonomy or the classification of the photographs. Because it was so ambitious, the only way that Sander could organise the whole thing was to break it down into various categories. And those categories were the farmer, the skilled tradesman, woman, classes and professions, the artists, the city, and finally the last people, which were classified as idiots, the sick, the insane, and dying. And this is where the dwarves were shoved, along with photos like this, which is simply titled Cretin 1924. Now obviously the world and its attitudes have moved on significantly. And I'm not trying to have a dig at Sander, whose eye was incredibly democratic and broad, uh, but it just does show uh, some of the crap that little people have had to put up with over the years just because they're short. Um, one thing that I think it's really, really necessary to take on board here is that there just aren't very many dwarves out there. Um, there's estimated to be uh, no more than 650,000 dwarves in the entire world, which means there's fewer dwarves than there are people that live in Luxembourg. So uh, you can understand why photographers get a bit excited when they see a dwarf, uh, because they want to take a photograph of people that look different. That's partly what a lot of street photography is. It's, it's picking out things that are unusual or people that are unusual or stand out and that's what dwarves do. Um, looking back through my entire back catalogue of 25 years of street photography I can only find two uh, dwarf photographs that I've ever taken in all that time. Uh, the first one is this which is from the Cannes Film Festival about 20 years ago where some PR company had conspired to bring together the world's smallest man and the world's tallest man for a film that no one remembers anymore. And then there's this one, which I took in a local supermarket when I lived in North London. Now, for many years, I felt slightly guilty about this photo, but doing this episode has made me revisit it, and I like it a lot more now, and I'll come back to it later on and attempt to explain to you why I've changed my mind and why I now think it's okay. Um, so at this point, I'm just going to show you very quickly a few unconnected individual dwarf photographs uh, before we take a look at uh, a few projects in greater depth. Um, bizarrely, all of these seem to come from New York. I don't know why that is or what that means, but they do. So this first one is by Lisette Modell from 1950. Um, and then there's this one from William Klein's 1955 book, New York is Good and Good for You, etc, 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 that we've touched upon uh, several times in the past now already. Um, the dwarf here is being hoisted aloft while smoking a pipe, and Klein's notes simply read, 29th Street and 2nd Avenue, the dwarf is king of the block. Um, this next one is by Gary Winogrand from 1968, and I love the way that Winogrand has got the dwarf giving someone else the eye. So he's looking at her hat box and there's even a couple of dogs sniffing around in the background for good measure. And finally, here's one from 1983 by Frank Horvat. Uh, I felt that we should actually have a colour one somewhere in this episode. But like I said earlier on, these are all just uh, individual images and it's very difficult to talk about any of these uh, in any great detail or depth. Uh, however, there are a few more substantial projects, and probably the most famous and one of the best is by Bruce Davidson. So Davidson was only 24 years old in 1958 when he went and shot this essay at the Clyde Beatty Circus in New Jersey. Remarkably, he had already been mentored by Henri Cartier-Bresson at Magnum by then, and this was his 14th assignment for them. But it was also to become by far his most personal, despite the fact that as a child he'd never visited the circus. So when he went to take these photos, it was his very first trip, and pretty quickly he honed in on one character in the Big Top, and this was the circus dwarf known as Little Man, but his real name was Jimmy Armstrong. So this photograph here is probably the most famous photograph of Jimmy Armstrong, and it's also one of Davidson's most well-known images. And it's also the first, or one of the first photographs, that Davidson took of him. In fact, you can see from this contact sheet of Davidson's visit to the circus that it was only the 10th photo he took of a stint that lasted for a whole month. 
Before we go and look at some more of these photos, I should point out that Jimmy Armstrong was quite a well-known and well-photographed character, and that Davidson wasn't the first or the last photographer to have him as a subject. So some years earlier, in the 1940s, Ouija had also photographed him, on more than one occasion. Although it's also worth noting that Jimmy Armstrong is not the dwarf pictured on the front of Ouija's Naked City book, which is taken from this New Year's Eve 1943 picture. That was a dwarf called Shorty, also known as the Bowery Cherub, seen here wearing nothing but a pair of diapers and drinking at Sammy's bar, although not fighting a flamingo. Also, Jimmy Armstrong is not this dwarf, who Ouija photographed being led into court in New York City in 1940 and is captioned as Jerry Austin, dwarf accused of rape. Ouija never missed a story. However, apparently this is Jimmy Armstrong, caught by Andre Cortez in 1959 as he dropped some money into a blind accordionist's cup. Like I explained earlier, there aren't actually that many dwarves out there, so photographers tend to hone in on them. But let's get back to Bruce Davidson because what he attempted to do with this project was to get behind or beyond the performances and to scrape away all the layers of makeup and reveal the true person beneath. He wanted to show what was going on with Jimmy Armstrong the human being rather than just showing Jimmy Armstrong the performing dwarf. And that's quite a radical thing because even though most of these photographs were by necessity taken in the circus, which is where Armstrong lived and worked, they also help provide an insight and a balance into his life. They help make him a fully realised person instead of a, simply a dwarf and a clown. So for every photograph like this, Davidson also gives us far more reflective photographs like this. Or this. Davidson's respectful approach led to the two men becoming true friends. I even managed to find this photo of the two of them together in 1958. And apparently, when he finished after a month of virtually living at the circus, Davidson gave Jimmy Armstrong a present. He gave him a camera, a Yashica twin lens reflex, and they kept in touch as Armstrong went and toured around the country. But Davidson never got to see the photographs that the little man might have taken, and he regrets it to this day. Bruce Davidson is now 89 years old. Jimmy Armstrong died in 1984. Davidson's work with Jimmy Armstrong has slowly become more and more famous over time, although uh, at the time, in 1958, it didn't actually get published. It wasn't until Esquire published a couple of photos from it a few years later that uh, these images started to be seen in the wider realm. Uh, however, there have been uh, far, far more uh, dwarf-based projects than you might imagine. Um, a whole year before Davidson took his photos at the Clyde Beatty Circus in 1957, a life photographer called Alan Grant went to a rather peculiar convention in Reno, Nevada to photograph the first annual Midgets of America conference. This was obviously a very newsworthy story, and the Midgets of America, which later transformed into the Little People of America, is an organisation that is still going to this day. Alan Grant covered the conference, I'm tempted to say in minute detail, but I'll resist the urge to sink that low. What is noticeable about his photographs is that a lot of them are performative, or slightly tongue-in-cheek. So there's a lot of photographs of dwarfs meeting little children, dwarfs sitting up on crap tables, or on full-size women's laps, or on step ladders so they can reach the jackpot machines, or struggling to reach postcards, or even falling off the step ladders at the jackpot machines. Many of these photos feel like setups, and although occasionally Grant does manage to catch a moment that feels real and honest, these are a world away from uh, Bruce Davidson's more intimate and thoughtful images. But it's also worth remembering that these are the kind of photos that sold. These got published, whereas Davidson's took time to be appreciated. Um, another essay that I found is this one from Ebony in October 1965, which has a strap line on the front cover um, there, which reads, The Little People, Tiny Minority with Big Problems. And this is a much better article, which is a genuine attempt to give an insight into the day-to-day -day life of a black dwarf called Kenneth Brown and it opens with this tremendous photo of him walking through downtown Philadelphia. I should point out before we go any further that I have no real idea who took any of these photographs. 
The article is written by Alvin Adams, but I don't think he took the photos. There's no credit at all, and so it's possibly one of the star photographers, Manita Sleep Jr., Maurice Sorrell, Isaac Sutton, or G. Marshall Wilson. Manita Sleep Jr. was a fantastic photographer who won a Pulitzer Prize for his photography and worked for Ebony for 41 years, and so I'm going to presume that he shot the images for this article because they're absolutely great. It's also partially pegged to a conference. You can see in the background here that the Midgets of America has now transformed into the Little People of America, and so there are a few photographs that show Kenneth socialising and dancing while explaining that, unlike Negroes who can sing about overcoming the racial problem, little people know they shall never grow tall. And what the article and the photograph do attempt to show is what life is like not only for Kenneth, but also for a number of other dwarves, even if that involves wrestling and boxing. It seems that it's very difficult for any dwarf to totally escape the performative expectations that are placed upon them. Now, way, way back in just episode two of Show and Tell, I looked at Diane Arbus and her photographs of the Jewish giant, uh, Eddie Carmel. Uh, and while I was doing that, I also mentioned that she photographed a few dwarfs. There's this family of Russian dwarves, and the entertainer Andrew Potato Chips Ratuchev, who apparently impersonated Maurice Chevalier and also performed in drag as Marilyn Monroe. And also there's this fantastic shot of a partially clad Mexican dwarf in his hotel room taken in 1970. This is a photograph that achieves something very rare in dwarf photography in that it acknowledges adult dwarfs as real sexual beings not just infantilised little people who will never reach sexual maturity, regardless of their age. By photographing this man in his bedsheets with a bottle of booze just behind him, Arbus allows him to be seen as an adult with adult needs and desires. In fact, I can only really think of two other photographs that do something similar, and strangely, they're both of the same person. This is a photograph taken at the New Orleans Mardi Gras by Mitch Epstein in 1975, and it shows a couple of men in bondage gear, one of whom is a dwarf. I have no further information about these two, other than they certainly seem to be having a good time, and they're far more comfortable wearing nothing but chains and posing pouches out in public than I ever would be. But now look at this photo, also taken at the New Orleans Mardi Gras, possibly also in 1975, but this time by Bruce Gilden. Snap! It's them again, this time in black and white, but still the centre of attention. I like to think that these two photos go some way to showing how society, in America at least, was moving into a more tolerant and accepting direction. If you compare these two photos with, say, Ouija's from 30 years previously, in one you have a dwarf dressed in a nappy as a bar mascot, and then here you have a couple, one of whom happens to be a dwarf, and out wandering the streets in bondage gear. And if that isn't progress, then I don't know what is. Uh, now we're going to come back to America in a little bit, but uh, in the meantime, we're going to quickly go and take a look at a project that was done in India, although by an American photographer, and that's uh, Mary Ellen Mark and the fantastic work she did with an Indian circus. And this is from the 1980s. Uh, Mary Ellen Mark, very much like Bruce Davidson, uh, were by becoming deeply involved with the people she photographed and building up their trust until she was able to photograph them behaving naturally, having accepted her as part of their world. And it's telling that for this project she never really photographed any of the performers performing. They're all seen here before and after, going about their lives backstage with their family members and their animals. Mary Ellen Mark commented on how hard the circus performance in India both little and full-sized, had to work and train, and the overwhelming feeling that comes from looking at these images is one of exhaustion. Everyone seems extremely tired. And even though her photography gives these little people their dignity, she also interviewed them all about their lives, and it's the words of one dwarf in particular who says that, I'm a dwarf because when my mother conceived, she must have seen a dwarf the next morning. That's my wife had a dwarf because she saw my face the next morning. And when you read that, you realise how much harder it must be for a dwarf in a circus in India compared to a dwarf in bondage gear wandering the streets of New Orleans. So there are just a few photographers left to look at. And the next one is someone who, if you know anything about his work, you might find it unusual or unexpected to see his stuff placed alongside that of Mariana Mark and Bruce Davidson, both of you whom are traditional uh, sort of documentary photographers, whereas this photographer is far more conceptual and known for his uh, set-up images 
in a directorial mode. I'm talking about uh, Les Crims, who in the early 70s produced a number of projects that he described as being anti-decisive moments. He even did a series of photographs called Piss Portraits in which photo notables such as Edward Weston here had their likenesses created by a man urinating their outlines into flour. This, possibly fortunately, is the only example I can find. Crims is an arch provocateur um, and his photographs can drive some people uh, near mad. In 1971, an exhibition of Crims photos in Tennessee pissed the man off so much that he kidnapped a child and wouldn't give him back until the gallery took down the photos. Honestly, I'm not making this up. Here's one of those photos and please, no one go out and kidnap a child just because you've seen it. Um, then hilariously, several years later, Crims even published a box portfolio of all the relevant photos called The Only Photographs in the World Ever to Cause a Kidnapping. But these aren't the Les Crims photos that we're going to look at today. Um, in 1971, uh, Crims turned his attention to a group of people he described as the ultimate minority when he managed to become the official photographer for the little people of America. So again, here's that organisation that we first saw photographed in 1957 in Reno, proving irresistible to a photographer. Crims produced two lots of work. One was a series called Les Crims and the Seventeen Dwarfs, although I've only been able to find two of these. Uh, but his other more substantial project is just called The Little People of America 1971. However, in this, Crims wasn't going to treat the dwarves as players for him to direct and place in imagined scenarios, as he'd done in much of his previous work. Instead, he was determined to photograph them neutrally and by doing so prove that just because they were dwarfs, they weren't any different from anyone else. So in addition to some pose portraits that took place at the convention, we also have more day-to-day -day domestic shots of dwarfs at home or swimming and with their pets and children. Um, some of these versions I've got to show you here aren't that best quality. These images aren't particularly well known. Although Les Crims himself has replied to my emails and very kindly sent me uh, a full set of low res images. Um, these photographs have been labelled democratic and Crims wants to show that dwarves are the same as you and me, just smaller. And crucially, that means that they have to be treated in exactly the same way as you and me. Crims is trying to do something very subtle and actually quite radical here. There's a real danger when photographing dwarves, or any minority for that matter, to treat them with kid gloves and patronise them, never daring to show them in a bad light and avoiding any kind of satire or humour. But that in itself simply treats them differently and sets them apart. The challenge is to produce photographs that show these little people just as people, without obsessing about their height. Although it's worth noting that the deluxe edition of the folio came with a 58 inch tape measure. Uh, 58 inches is four foot 10, which is the tallest height you can be and still be considered a dwarf. And maybe now it's worth quickly coming back to that photo of mine I showed you much earlier. Maybe now you think this photo is okay. After all, it's just a photo of some people who happen to be short, having to contend with a world that isn't built for them. Because what's the alternative here? The alternative is never to take photos like this and effectively airbrush those people out of the world, which seems wrong, doesn't it? Given how few of them there are in the first place. Now, of course, the only thing we haven't seen so far are any photographs taken by dwarfs, um, which is quite tricky given, as I've explained, how few of them there are in the world to begin with. Um, the only dwarf photographer that I've been able to find is this guy, Ricardo Gill. Here's a great photograph of him standing in the male urinals and thus highlighting how the normal sized environment just doesn't consider people of his stature. So Ricardo Gill has no alternative other than to take photographs from his perspective and here are some of them. Now I wish that they were great but honestly I don't think they are. Um, it should be pointed out that I haven't seen that many though. His website no longer seems to be working so I've only had a very small selection to look at but I'm not bothered by the fact that he isn't a fantastic street photographer. Like I explained earlier, I think it's better to just treat him the same as any other photographer. So I'm happy that his work exists, but I'm not gonna patronize him and say that I think he's truly tremendous simply because he's a dwarf. Um, although I do very much admire the fact that when he had an exhibition, um, he hung the entire thing at dwarf level 
so all the normal people had to crouch down to take a look at it. I also spent quite a while trying to Google the heights of all the famous uh, street photographers so I could try and compile some kind of table of uh, who was the tallest and who was the smallest and then attempt to examine their work and see if their height and therefore their perspective affected the images. But no one has yet made a definitive list of street photographers' heights and so that's just yet another abandoned project. Now I was going to end this episode here but then I thought it might be revealing and instructive to take a look at a few films, a few movies that feature dwarves because um, there has been a hell of a lot of them and quite honestly the way uh, dwarves are treated in film can be really quite shocking. The first and most famous film is Todd Browning's Freaks from 1932, which features a whole host of circus performers, including conjoined twins and people who were described as pinheads. But the main plot of Freaks revolved around a dwarf who falls in love with a full-size woman, a trapeze artist who turns out to be a horrible piece of work and subsequently gets her comeuppance. In case you've never seen it, I won't reveal what happens to her, but everyone should watch this film because despite its sensationalist title and the strapline on the poster, can a fully grown woman truly love a midget, Freaks is a great movie in that it puts this strange family of performers front and centre. They're a genuine community and the film gives a moving starring role to Harry Earls, who it has to be said looks just like Jesse Plemons from Breaking Bad. I mean, it's not just me, is it? They're almost twins. Freaks, however, is a bit of a one-off. It's a freakish film to begin with because it gives dwarves a central role, whereas most of the time they are just consigned to oddities or uh, background uh, dressing. And the most um, obvious film and the most famous film that does this is, of course, The Wizard of Oz, which introduced the world to the munchkins and at the time featured virtually every dwarf working in entertainment in America. So Harry Earls was there along with 123 others, although none of them got their names in the credits. And it's also worth noting that Dorothy's dog Toto got paid $125 per week, whereas the dwarves were only on $50 a week. Wizard of Oz also gave life to a terrible slur that uh, was started by a completely and utterly pissed Judy Garland when she went on a talk show um, years later and uh, implied that all of the dwarves were uh, very, very badly behaved drunken leches. Munchkins? What, yeah. Well, how, what the munchkins do? Well, they were, they're they little were dwarfs. Tiny. Yeah. 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 Were they little kids or were they, they little were men? They were drunks. They were little drunks? <laughs> What they, what, 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 what they, you got me stuttering. <laughs> what do they do? What do they do? What do they do? What do they do? The, what the dwarfs do. But one of them, uh, who was about 40, a uh, uh, gentleman asked me for dinner, and I couldn't say, I don't want to go out 
I can't because you're a midget. And I, I just said, no, my mother wouldn't fight him. Oh, come on, bring him off, too, you know. How big was he? About two inches high. <laughs> what, what, what could you do with him? I don't know. They, what could he do? Uh, uh, I mean... Oh, I don't know. They haven't they did a lot because... Uh, there was a lot of them. Oh, you have hundreds of thousands. And they put them all in one hotel room. Not one room. One hotel in Culver City. Yeah. And they got smashed every night. And they'd pick them up in butterfly nets. <laughs> bald-faced cheek of Judy Garland uh, slagging off the dwarves for being drunkards while she was completely and utterly flying herself is really quite a thing to behold. Uh, although it was strong enough as, as a rumour to uh, sort of sully the Wizard of Oz midgets for years to come. And it's worth noting that the Little People of America, the organisation, was formed precisely because of how badly the Wizard of Oz uh, dwarves were treated. Um, in fact, the, the, the rumour and the reputation of the Wizard of Oz Dwarfs was uh, so bad at one point that there's an entire film that has been made about the making of the Wizard of Oz and their behaviour, uh, which is called Under the Rainbow. Guess what happened when 150 midgets checked into a hotel in Hollywood to make one of the world's biggest movies. I want a room. If you haven't already guessed, it'll be out shortly. Chevy Chase, Carrie Fisher, and 150 of Hollywood's smallest stars in Under the Rainbow, a giant comedy, coming from Orion Pictures. The list of big screen uh, dwarf movies is really, really quite long, and we haven't got time to do them all here, so I'm just going to mention three more. Um, and the first is the most recent, and it's Martin Scorsese's The Wolf of Wall Street, which was made uh, 10 years ago now in 2013. Although uh, the attitude it has towards dwarfs is really quite shocking. I mean, it features uh, famous scenes involving dwarf tossing. And then conversations like this. My name is Throw the shit out of this little fucking thing. Yeah, you should so fucking toss if it, it gets hurt, what happens? Because we're going to get fucking nuts. I don't think he's going to get hurt. They're like, they got like superhuman strength. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to be fine. Okay. I say we stick with the loophole, right? Okay. If we don't consider him a human, we just consider it an act. I think we're in the clear. Like the flying Willendas, you know, a lot of those guys died, but they never sued anybody. The fallout from that film is that uh, many states in the US are still involved in uh, suits to try and ban dwarf tossing as a practice, which seems quite astonishing that they were still talking about this sort of behaviour in 2023. Now, it would be incredibly uh, remiss of me to do anything about dwarves in cinema without talking about uh, the actor Peter Dinklage, who is probably the most famous uh, dwarf actor out there and is mainly known for his fantastic role um, in Game of Thrones, uh, where he plays Tyrion Lannister. I'm guilty of a far more monstrous crime. I'm guilty of being a dwarf. You are not on trial for being a dwarf. Oh, yes I am. I've been on trial for that my entire life. But while that rant, uh, that particular rant, is very, very famous and very well known, it's worth bearing in mind that it's the kind of rant that uh, Peter Dinklage has been making now for years and years, decades even. Um, way, way back in 1995, he starred in a film called Living in Oblivion, where he played Tito, the dwarf, in a film directed by Tom DiCillo, which is all about the making of an ill-fated so indie movie. Good. And Peter cute. Dinklage in this gets to deliver right. a fantastic rant after once. being cast as a dwarf right. in a surreal reach. dream Good. sequence. Good. You're at her hard. Hard. Why does it have to be a dwarf? What? Why does my character have to be a dwarf? It doesn't have to be a dwarf. <laughs> then why is he? Is that the only way you can make this a dream? Put a dwarf in it? No, Tito. I... Have you ever had a dream with a dwarf in it? Do you know anyone who's had a dream with a dwarf in it? No! I don't even have dreams with dwarves in them. The only place I've seen dwarves in dreams is in stupid movies like this. Oh, make it weird. Put a dwarf in it. Everyone will go, whoa, whoa, whoa. There, it must be a fucking dream. There's a fucking dwarf in it. Well, I'm sick of it. You can take this dream sequence and shove it up your ass. 
Dinklage is also cast as a randy French, possibly French Canadian dwarf in a film that is so bad, uh, I almost dread to mention it, but I have to. Um, it's a film called Tiptoes. And uh, well, I'll just let you watch the trailer first. Carol and Stephen's life together was perfect. I've got to get going. Right this second. Hey, sweetie. I love you. There's one small problem. Hi, I'm Ralph. I'm his brother. We're twins. Are your parents, um... Yeah. It can tear them apart. I think you're gonna let me know that everyone in your family's a midget. They're not midgets, Carol. They're dwarfs. Whatever. Or bring them together. Hey, welcome. I'm Steven. Oh, there you are. This is Steven's father, Bruno, and his mom, Kathleen. And over behind the bar is Steven's brother, Rolf. Hi. You could have prepared us for this, don't you think? If you embarrass me, I'll never speak to you again, so just get it together. Hey there, by the drink. I think maybe I'm pregnant. When the going gets rough, it's only the size of your heart that counts. Would it really be that big of a deal if our kid was a dwarf? You knocked up this great girl, and you didn't tell her that her baby's probably going to be little. I'm not like you. We are so cute and cuddly. Don't discriminate against us. So that's right. Matthew McConaughey has met the girl of his dreams, played by Kate Beckinsdale, but he's failed to tell her that his brother and his parents are all dwarves. Um, and therefore, that if they have any children, that they might also be dwarves. Now, his brother, if you probably noticed, is played by full-size actor Gary Oldman who played him on his knees. I really just don't know what it's possible to say about this truly terrible idea other than the film is just quite boring and bad and I definitely wouldn't urge you all to follow the link below to where you can watch the whole shocking thing for free here on YouTube. Now Gary Oldman is also a very very keen photographer and I was sincerely hoping that I would be able to segue effortlessly here into a whole bit where I analyse his photography while making some witty dwarf and perspective based jokes but there's not much of it online and mainly it just seems to be tasteful behind the scenes black and white stuff a bit like Jeff Bridges work uh, but not as good. Um, my conclusion is that if you compare uh, the way dwarves have been treated in film to the way they've been treated in photography, I think you fairly rapidly uh, come to understand that photography is more kind and more honest. Um, the subjects of, you know, Bruce Davidson's uh, relationship with Jimmy Armstrong is very much a human relationship of equals. And, you know, there's a kind of tenderness and there's a genuine friendship there. He's never casting Jimmy Armstrong in a role that he feels he should be playing. Um, and it's an absolute world away from the dwarf tossing of the Wolf of Wall Street or, you know, the sort of Gary Oldman walking around on his knees. Even if he's trying to be sympathetic in a way, it's it's ridiculous. Why is this going on in, in, in modern society? It's absolutely absurd. Anyway, um, I'm going to shut up there and stop talking about dwarves and try and think of something to do for next week. Uh, so yeah, my name's Stephen Leslie. If you've enjoyed this, then you know there's loads of others you can watch. Um, also, just to let people know, um, I'm still doing photography workshops. I try to do them at the start of every month in London. So if you're interested, get in touch about that. I'm also doing a talk in New York in uh, April at uh, the New York City Street Photography Center. Uh, there's details online. And uh, the new book will be coming soon. Honestly, I promise you it is coming soon. It's just taking me a little while longer to get going. Anyway, so uh, yeah, thanks for watching um, and hope to see you all again soon. Bye.